Aris, when you hear the word capitalism, what do you think of first? United States. Giovanna, what do you think of? I think about businesses. And is that good or bad? Both. Mm -hmm. And you hear the word capitalism, what do you think? I think about money and becoming rich. Andrea. Freedom. Freedom. Koki, what do you think? Inequality. Sebastian. Opportunity. Wendy. Mechanism to organize and plan resources. This intellectual approach. Irene. Um, industrialization. Is that good or bad? Uh, it's good on the side it fosters the economies. It's on the bad side because it makes people slaves to capitalism. Hey, Ling, capitalism. Private. Ari, capitalism. Um, flawed opportunity. Gaurav. Efficiency. Uh, yeah, when you say capitalism, when you hear capitalism, what do you think of? Uh, accumulation. Barry. Cash flow. Nicholas. Freedom and opportunity. Jeff. Oppression. Kevin. A wealth distribu distribution. In a good way or bad way? Either. Monica. Uh, markets and profits. Chuang. Um, inequality. Manson. Creating prosperity. Mauricio. Individualism. The American dream. Does it, do you relate to it? Do you find it offensive? When you hear it, you hear those words, how do you react? I mean, honestly, sometimes um, when I hear the American dream to me, I'm, I'm just like, again, it's, it's a lot about, especially when you, you look at the African continent, it's, it's a lot about uh, what people see in movies, what people see in music, that's, again, this idealized um, concept, um, when in reality, opportunities are right the, next to their doors, and you hear people that go and come back and tell you that the American dream literally doesn't exist, right? But again, it goes back to how everyone defines it, and I, and I feel like it's, it's, it's just a bit messed up, in my opinion, yeah. That's great. I love that line, the American dream is just a bit messed up. Sure. When you hear the phrase American dream, what's your reaction? Yeah, like to me, the, the phrase American dream doesn't represent all American because when you say American, it includes all the, like the all, like all people in the States. So, but American dream represents only will the people who can enrich and, and take the, the resources and make the profit of it. So like some people will be under me so they cannot make anything out of American dream. So it does represent certain group of people who can make will they or we can make their life easier than other Americans. So I think the American dream, there are two sides when I think of it. I think one of them is how I've seen people when I was growing up in Brazil, people that wanted to go to the United States and they wanted to, to benefit from everything that the United States had to offer. And I've recently seen that um, decrease. People don't want to go to the US as much as they wanted to before because they see that right now it's not as it was in the past. And at the same time, I see the American dream as something that is to uh, achieve a level of economic success that I feel like has been reflected in several different cultures, even though that wasn't the primary intention in the first place, but that people see now as having a good um, job and a good house and being able to have purchasing power. And to them, that's what success is. And that has changed a lot of people and a lot of cultures throughout the world. Look ahead 20 years. Who is gonna be the number one economic power, China or the US? Raise your hands if you think it's gonna be China. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, Jeff, Irene, Hind, Monica, tell me why you think two decades from now China is gonna be in charge. Jeff, you start. Um, just look at the trajectory of things, right? We are growing at an exponential speed and we are not slowing down. And we still have a large population that is not used, who are doing basic work. And with the development of the internet, development of more factories, more advanced technologies, our economic or our GDP growth speed will still be able to maintain. 
And as long as we are able to maintain the speed of growth, we'll definitely exceed America and maybe the rest of the world. So I feel like it's 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 really hard to tell. But then in my opinion, I feel like um the fact that China has such a huge population, and then just as just uh Jeff said earlier, like the huge um the like the really um fast growing like pace and pace in terms of technology or like economic growth, like a lot of things adding together, these are going to shift the economic power essentially to China. And then like, perhaps that's also why more and more people in the society, like, or just in the whole world are trying to learn Chinese or otherwise, like, why are people doing so right now? Ken, why do you think China is going to be number one? China will be number one for the simple reason that it has been strategizing this for the longest time, I would say. I think that the Belt and Road Initiative is one of the biggest examples showing that, um, you know, it is in China's strategy to be number one in the, in the next few years. Um, and most importantly, it has not been ignoring one country, which is Africa, which I would say has been uh, pretty much ignored by the Europeans and the Americans um, for the longest time. Um, and it has been uh, pretty much... Uh, there has been a lot of extraction from the continent rather than giving back, whereas China is helping to build it and uh, bring it forward. I think that's one of the challenge, right? Because um, I think there's a lot of sayings in the world that thinks China is a suppressive country. And I think those voices will grow into the politics of the world, other countries. I think that's one of the major challenges we face. And also, let's not forget that China is able to reach a substantial growth over the past few decades because it has integrated it into the world order with America's help. America and China grew together over the past few decades, helped each other, benefited from each other, and it helped China to alleviate so much poverty to grow into such an economic powerhouse right now. But with the current dynamic of US treating China as a direct opposite, trying to sanction China, and China also not, um, so both the countries not working together towards the same goal, I think it's very hard to predict how the future will look like. I would like to see a world where the two countries would work together, promote the same goal, so we can all be better off. So honestly, that sounds like the Chinese government line, is it? But isn't it what uh, what everyone wants? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, Irene, go ahead. Um, I really like a lot of ideas you just brought up, but I want to say that, like the U.S. have passed the best moment to depress China like during this during that period when it, when us should actually depress china it focused on uh terrorism which is actually a bad choice if us really want to depress china and be, behind the questions of china wing economics that is the questions of, of whether america can let the rise of a new hegemony in F, uh, asia and this is a question because it comes to decided whether America can depress China, which is the problem because I believe more countries will actually allies with China in a way that China is not military very strong, which cannot be a really a, a real threat to them, even though they allies with China. But if they allies with China, they can get economic boost. That that's that's a personal opinion. The world CEOs are watching you right now. What advice would you give the world CEOs? I'd ask them to work together, not only amongst themselves, but with the governments and individuals so that we can really create a circular economy that is better for everyone involved, um, that, you know, that we can see our children and our grandchildren growing up in a world that is fair and that is um, sustainable. And um, they need to take responsibility really for creating a, a world that we want to live in. I would tell them to simply apply what they promote to care about, specifically ESG. I personally had the experience of uh, working at a Fortune 500 and I've seen that what's written on paper, what's written on websites, caring about the environment can sometimes be simply on paper, whereas the people who are actually working just want to make profit. So let's take uh, these things a little more seriously and make sure that we act for the future generations. I would tell them that they need to quantify their impact as much as they quantify their profits. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice to have these corporate responsibility programs, but they should implement the same efficiency they implement in optimizing supply chains and impacting people's lives.
to come together and collectively redefine success, uh, moving away from just profit maximization to look at all the stakeholders in the society that you can actually influence. And I say to come together because if 500 companies are chasing one thing, then one co the other company cannot have different priorities. So it's about time everybody comes together and collectively redefines what success is for a company. I was reading a Bloomberg article that talked about uh, trillions of dollars that were lost from the US or added to the US deficit because of uh, bank loan policies that um, were denied to black Americans. On that basis, I would um, implore the CEOs to invest in underprivileged communities to fund small businesses. Uh, profit maximization is a uh, fine goal to have, but research indicates one way of doing that is to invest in these communities for the long term. Getting more people to interact with the economic system is a way to economically prosper as a company and as a country. America's interested in how the globe has reacted to what happened in the U.S. on Election Day and over the last three months. We don't know how the world has responded. We know how we've responded. What do you think of the American political process over the last three months? And whether you think America is a country to follow or to avoid? I want to focus on the political process now. Should America be followed? or avoided and tell me about the last three months and your reaction. I think it's it's heartbreaking. And you know, Frank, I told you growing up in Peru, Latin America, there's a lot of influence from the US there. And I told you growing up, I thought I was gonna go to the US. I thought I was a, an American citizen only to then grow up and realize that we are in different countries, but that's the level of influence that the US has. And now I don't, I don't wanna to go to the US and that's heartbreaking. And that's because there's no more discourse. There's no more listening, hearing to each other. Wow, that's why I enjoy doing this and why it's heartbreaking for me as well as to listen to how people view the US. I think the, the dramatic events on, uh, on the inauguration day showed us that there are more, no more shared principles or ethical norms. While 10 years ago, we might have disagreed between Republicans and Democrats about issues on policy or economics, but we all agreed that America had to go in the same direction. Now, I'm afraid that's not the case anymore. Uh, a few years ago, I told you that the overriding sense that I got was that the entire nation was riding an escalator of anxiety. And I think what we saw on January the 6th was what happens when you hit the top of the escalator. And there's just so much pressure built up on every direction and on every side. I, I, my only hope is that in the weeks that have happened since then, that there has been a, a ratcheting down of the pressure and of the temperature. Uh, whether or not that is something that will stay in perpetuity or whether that is something that is just temporary and will fade once the honeymoon of the new administration is over is something left to be decided. Why is NYU Abu Dhabi exceptional? It's a microcosm of a perfect, almost perfect cosmopolitan society. The interpersonal skills we develop here and the ideas that be, are being brought to the table are truly amazing. It's a unique multicultural and diverse environment that brings the best, young and brightest minds in the world to find common solutions to the world's most pressing issues. I think that the world is becoming a global society and in order to move it forward, we need people who are aware of the global challenges uh, in order to best tackle them. And that's what NYU Abu Dhabi offers. It best equips people to go out in the world and make the, the, place, the world a better place. For me, I've had the opportunity to experiment with subjects from public policy, public health to philosophy. And all of that is galvanizing me to think about tackling global issues and doing the most good for the world as a whole. Uh, I think that for a truly globalized and connected world, you need a truly globalized and connected institution. And that's what NYU Abu Dhabi offers, uh, a unique liberal arts education that is nowhere like anywhere, anywhere else in the world. Um, NYU Abu Dhabi is a really highly connected society, which serves as a model for the world to see how different cultures can actually coexist. I think for me, what makes this place unique is just the ability to have conversation as such. Um, where people can actually disagree and yet understand that we're all striving to solve the same issues in the world. 
I think this is the place I learned what it means by seeking common grounds while reserving our differences. And also it taught me how important this phrase is. Well, before NYU Abu Dhabi, I had never even been outside of the United States and the world just seemed so separate and disconnected from my reality, from uh, domestic policy. And really NYU just opened up my mind so much to how interconnected everything is. I think you really get a, a more nuanced understanding of empathy when you break bread with students and friends from countries that your own is at war with. That is when you really reach another level of hearing their stories and their perspective.